Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. Welcome back to the show, everybody. And here's a question. If you're a physician, how do you start a company? And more importantly, if you're going to invest the time and money, how do you exit it? Well, this episode is going to be kicking off a new series that I want to uh, do more of, which is exits, right? How do you start and exit a company? And so for my first episode here, we have a clinician, and that's Dr. Gregory Hansen. So he has a really interesting background. So Dr. Hansen, um, was a you know physician who graduated from uh, Dartmouth with his MD and was a interventional radiology resident when he came up with this idea where essentially he thought of a service marketplace where physicians and clients who are seeking medical expertise could essentially meet in a localized and centralized location. Kind of think of like an Upwork or Fiverr physician. So a client, you know, like a pharma company, red tech company can post any job, let's say due diligence or uh, writing content or clinical paper, focus group, etc. cetera, um, and they can't find the right physician. Well, Dr. Hansen thought about this and created FlipMD, where uh, physicians in every specialty essentially compete for and take these roles. And instead of searching through thousands of physicians or paying uh, thousands to a recruiter just to meet a physician, uh, a med tech company or really any company can post their job for free in this platform and wait to hear back from a variety of physicians uh, who are on there, right? FlipND uh, really was around just for barely two years and they essentially got acquired by GoodRx, which is really impressive. And more impressively, um, Dr. Hansen didn't raise a whole lot of money, which means that he did not dilute his investors or himself and had a fantastic exit event. And so for this episode, we talked to Dr. Hansen about how he came up with the idea, how did he go about um, you know, essentially developing his MVP or minimally viable product, and then more importantly, how do you position a company and get the traction needed so that somebody decides to acquire it? Now, because this is a clinical episode for clinicians, I'm going to be making this a CME eligible event. So you can unlock your AMA PRA category one CME credit. All you got to do is listen and then click the link found in the notes below and go and just reflect on what you learned and how you're going to apply it. And you're going to get one CME credit uh, being unlocked courtesy of our partners over at CMFI. And lastly, a couple other plugs before we jump in. Number one is if you're a medtech CEO or a founder, maybe you're a clinician who's deciding to start a company. If you need help with getting traction, attracting investors at scale, and attracting potential adopters right, of your technology, the best way to do this, in my opinion, that's scalable and most cost-effective is using network effects on social media. I help companies do this, whether it's through my podcast, The State of MedTech, or other different ways through are the platforms and strategies that I provide. So if you're interested, please shoot me a message on LinkedIn or send me an email at hello at katibandco.com. And finally, if you're an orthopedic surgeon and you're interested in becoming a digital opinion leader, right? How do you develop a thought leadership brand and reputation online that attracts not only investors, but startup uh, advising opportunities, career opportunities, and more? I launched a course just for that. And it's called the Orthopedic Digital Opinion Leadership Masterclass. And you can go and get early bird access to this. It's only $129 and you get 25 CME credits. You can unlock 25 CME credits. That alone, I mean, it probably costs thousands of dollars. You're only gonna pay 129 bucks. You can unlock and check out more on the course if you go to orthodigitalopinionleader.com. And if you're not an orthopedic surgeon, you can actually take this course as well. I just decided to focus first on orthopedic surgeons because the private group is centered around this, but 99% of the content on in this course, which is all self-paced, is essentially applicable regardless of what specialty you're in. So if you wanna get in at the ground floor for the next specialty I'm gonna work on, feel free to just go ahead and take the course, 
leave a comment or shoot me a message. Let me know what specialty you're in and I'll create a special group just for that so we can start. But especially if you're an orthopedic surgeon, you're definitely gonna wanna check out that course. So head over to orthodigitalopinionleader.com and start. Now, let's get on to our episode with Dr. Gregory Hansen. Enjoy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Omar M. Khatib. And just as a reminder, since this is more of a, a clinician-focused episode, just be sure to click the show notes below. Unlock that AMA PRA Category 1 CME credit. Just take 15 seconds and write down what you learned. So today I'm joined by my good friend, Dr. Greg Hansen. Uh, Greg uh, is a physician entrepreneur, or I guess they call it physicianpreneur or surgeonpreneur, one of those things, uh, and founded, founded his own company, had a successful exit. So we kind of want to talk to you, Greg, today about what that's like as a physician starting a company, positioning it for exit, what are the things you learned, um, and probably the wild ass stories that you had along the way. So, so, you know, maybe a little bit of background, like give us a little background on your, on your medical, on your medical education. Like what kind of physician are you? How did you get into medicine? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Um, so I'm originally from California. I grew up in Sacramento, um, eventually went down to Southern California and went to actually UC San Diego for two years and then transitioned over to UCLA for my final two years. And, uh, after that, I ended up moving out to the East Coast, went to New York City and met my wife, then girlfriend at the time, uh, did grad school at Columbia. So I got my MPH in applied uh, biostatistics and epidemiology um, and at the same time applied to medical school and ended up getting into Dartmouth. So we moved up to the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire and uh, went there for four years, loved it, did a lot of skiing, um, had our first kid. We got our first dog. It was, uh, it was a good time in New Hampshire. And uh, Ended up, uh, I was kind of between a couple of different specialties. I was between general surgery, ortho, and interventional radiology slash diagnostic radiology. And ultimately did a rotation at a small um, hospital, community hospital called Concord Hospital, which is actually where my daughter was born. Um, and it was a surgery rotation. I was doing vascular surgery that day. And they were like, hey, is there anything you want to go see? And I was like, yeah, I would love to go see, you know, do you guys have an interventionalist? And they're like, yeah, let me take you down there. Um, it was one dude, one guy doing the entire department. Um, and I walk in and he was doing a vertebroplasty. And I was like, okay, this is pretty cool. Putting cement in um, and then literally just putting a Band-Aid on the patient and the patient like walked out. I was like, that's really cool. Um, so started looking into IR a lot more and ultimately decided kind of middle of third year of med school that this is what I wanted to do and applied broadly, applied to both interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology programs and was lucky enough to get into one of my top choices in IR and, uh, at Jefferson and here in Philadelphia and moved down to Philly right after med school and started, you know, surgical intern year working 80, 90, we won't say a hundred hours, but a hundred hours a week. Um, and, uh, it was kind of after that transition out of my surgical year where I went into diagnostic radiology, you go from, you know, those 80 hours a week down to like 45, depending on like when your conferences are a lot more time on your hands. Um, but at the same time, my daughter was starting school for the first time in Philadelphia and, uh, we had just bought a house down in South Philly, had some new bills to pay for that we didn't have before. And my salary didn't magically jump up like $15,000. So I needed to figure out a way to make a little extra cash on the side, which is kind of where the birth story of FlipMD came about. So originally I did basically consulting projects actually on Upwork, which is a freelancer community where you can find basically any type of person to do a project with you. And I started charging, I think like 35 or $40 an hour. Um, and I did random, random things, you know, article writing, data analysis, social media for a company. Technically, they're a public company. Um, it's like one of the, like the penny stock companies. And uh, ended, up ra or ended up getting about... I don't know, 30 or 40,000 in like six months doing that, just random, random things. And it was kind of around that time, my wife and I were like, you're getting all these opportunities on this non-medical platform. Why don't we just basically create the Upwork for physicians? And that's kind of where it came about. And that was the initial kind of impetus to be like, okay, yeah, like if I'm getting opportunities, there's probably opportunities for every other specialty out there. Um, and that was kind of like the decision. Um, it's a funny though, it was middle of the pandemic and it was like, we had two options. We had like a little nest egg for a resident. It was like 10 or 15,000 bucks saved up. And we we're like, well, 
we could either go and buy like a really cheap used RV and go travel around the country uh, to get out of Philadelphia on the weekends, or we could start a company and really roll the dice and see what happens. And ultimately, we decided to start the company, which was a great financial decision for us. Um, but yeah, that was that was really the, the background. And it was really just because I needed extra money. The idea came about and I was like, okay, let's see what happens. Nice. And so is that how you essentially position FlipMD is that it's the Upwork for physicians? Yeah, basically. It's, it's set up in a very similar way. So the two sides of a platform, you have the physician side, and then you have the company side. And so same basically marketplace dynamics. We had a take rate, we had, um, and then you have to also have those marketplace problems. Like, do you scale the physician side of things first? Do you scale the company side of things first? Um, so yeah, we ended up doing, we basically focused on grabbing companies, getting them into the platform to post a specific job. And then I would go out and try to find the physicians that match that person's job in like large groups. So 50 to 100 orthopedic surgeons or vascular surgeons that would come in and basically compete to get the job, um, which is how we grew the marketplace. Got it. So let's start from the very beginning. So like you're obviously, I mean, unless you, you haven't told me anything, you don't code. How did you, you know, had you have this idea? So where, where do you go and start a, a, as a physician entrepreneur? I mean, did you find somebody overseas? Like, where, how did take us back to that? Where, what was? How did you develop your MVP? And for those yeah. listening, that's a, that means minimally viable product. Yeah, for us. Uh, so I also had no business sense. I had no idea about starting a company. My wife is much more kind of entrepreneurial than I was at the beginning. Um, and so she had a little bit of like coding software engineering background from her previous work, uh, which was with ebooks. And, uh, and so she was really the one that was like, Hey, I'll figure out the technology side of things. So we ended up finding a development shop that split their time between, or they split their work base between India and Texas. And what they built was basically auction software. So literally like for websites that do specifically auctions, it's a very small niche. Uh, but we're like, well, that's probably the closest thing we can get to because technically we needed like a reverse auction um, software to be built where both sides could negotiate price. Um, and so that was the original company that we went with. We had them for like six, six or seven months, I think. Um, it was a ugly, ugly website, but it took about six to eight weeks to build. Um, it was technically functional. It was just not like the beautiful UI UX that you see on like really clean websites. It was again, yeah, like you said, it was an MVP. We just really needed to know, are people willing to go on this website to submit their documents for, so for the physicians, we needed to know, are you actually a physician? So we needed like, um, government issued ID. We needed something that said you went to medical school or that you're a current physician. Um, so like their license information. And once we got the MVP up, it was like, okay, we have people that are interested in this type of thing, this type of work, because they're actually signing up and giving us their documents for us to approve. Um, and that's kind of when we're like, okay, we can actually go out and do something with this. Um, so we'd probably only spent, we probably spent most of that, like 15,000 we had saved up to build that first platform. And then it was like, okay, we're getting, you know, a couple thousand people on this platform. We have a couple hundred people that are posting jobs. Now let's go out and see if we can raise a little capital. Got it. So then uh, before you raised any money, how, what was your traction like? Like how many users did you have on the platform and how many companies did you, did you have like roughly? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. Let me see if I can remember. Um, Probably from the first check that we brought in, we probably had between 500 and 700 physicians on the platform and probably around 50 clients that were posting stuff. Um, and clients were like, could be anybody. They could be posting you know, something for one physician. We also had companies that were kind of like a series A, series B level that were posting stuff for like 30 gastroenterologists and colorectal surgeons. So like the average project is really hard to like pin down in terms of how big it was. Um, but like the hourly rate physicians were seeing were like between 450 and 500 an hour. Um, and so, yeah, it was probably about 500, 700 physicians and yeah, around 50, 50 clients. So we felt and pretty comfortable. Did you, did you go like, um, did you acquire the physicians first and then went after uh, clients to post or what, which, so, which came first and how, and what was, what was the acquisition channel you used? 
Yeah. So we, in the very, very beginning, I wanted to get as many physicians into the platform. So I think we built up to like 200 or 300 physicians. Then I started going out full force to clients and I was Mm. like, Hey, we have a couple hundred doctors on the platform. Like, are you guys looking for any projects? And then it became very much focused on getting projects into the platform so that we could Mm. then grow the user base based off of those projects. How did you get those initial 200 users? So for me, like uh, product adoption and the psychology adoption is like a really big thing. How did you find those first 200 physicians and were there um, where they're viral spreaders, you know, because I think with every technology, especially with, with one that has a network effect, there's going to be a few like uh, adopters that are that are really the ones that drove the adoption, right? Like, how did you find how did you find them? And then do you are you able to identify like who those like uh, mass adopters were that really drove uh, uh, more to come? Yeah, the initial tranche of users really came from Facebook groups, physician specific Facebook uh. groups. Um, so that was the, honestly the easiest acquisition channel for us was basically going on to these, they're like non-clinical focused physician groups. So people that are interested in these non-clinical careers or remote careers. And I literally would just basically like span the group until I got kicked out. Um, and so that was the initial love kind of interest from the people was, you know, Hey, we have this platform that we're doing all the hard work of going to try to find these companies that are looking to work with physicians like you just join the platform and we'll see what we can get onto it. Uh, and so most of the users came from that, uh, those Facebook groups first. And then as we scaled, then it became, honestly, we didn't really do marketing towards physicians. It was much more like I needed to reach out to very specific folks. So I used LinkedIn, um, Sales Navigator, stuff like that to find the very specific people that I needed to talk to and then grew it that way. So each project that would come in, I would try to find between 50 and 100 different physicians that meet that criteria specifically. Um, And then we would also use that in the future and say, okay, like we just brought on 100 different orthopedic surgeons. Let me go and see if I can find more orthopedic surgery jobs for them to do. And I would just keep going acquiring more and more of those Uh, orthosurgeons. So so essentially it was, you know, you got some initial users on, then you got some companies onboarded. And then at that point, you know, you just kind of looked at what you needed and went and essentially, you know, found the users and put them in there. And then, you know, so a lot of this just sounded like a lot of like manual work, which, which is, I think, I mean, yeah, but you know, that that's honestly what it takes. I mean, look, like right now I have a, I have a SaaS, uh, uh, company called, uh, Omni creator. That's just for LinkedIn. Um, uh, content creation. There's like a creator community. Both my founder and I are doing what Paul Graham says, like unscalable things because they work, right? Which is like direct outreach, you know, uh, onboarding people one by one, and that's that's just what it takes. And I think I think a lot of founders, um, especially if you are new to tech and the whole startup scene, they they skip the step and they start thinking about like, oh, how do we scale this? I'm like, what what the hell? You have nothing to scale. What are you talking about? So I really admire the fact that like you did that. And that's, I think that's what it takes, right? I'm sure like along that path, like you learned a lot about your customer and figuring out like, how do we get like problem market fit and then move to product market fit and then like actually getting traction. Yeah. And the big thing for me too, was like, I didn't want just <laughs> random physicians coming into the platform and not having any jobs that they could apply to. Cause then it's like, if you're, you know, logging into this platform and there's absolutely nothing on there for you, you're not going to have a good experience. You're not going to come back in the future. So I really wanted and, to make sure there was something for everybody as they were signing. Uh, yeah. And I was going to say the other thing, this is why I kind of like really find, um, you can call it healthcare, you can call it med tech, but like working within the healthcare space is interesting and very difficult because physicians talk like it's a small close knit group. And like, if something does not work, or if it's not good, like they're like, like they're really vocal, man. Like there were like those Facebook like, groups are very vocal. <laughs> I know, man. Like, it's kind of like, like, uh, physicians, like in physician groups, like they, like, I worry more about them than like, te- like teenage bloggers, you know, <laughs> like, you know, if you, if you have a technology or a platform that doesn't seem to work very well, like they, they will, They'll be, they're very candid about it. And then God forbid, if you, if you do them wrong, like you're, you're done at that point, you know, it's a a pretty temperamental crowd, to be honest, in terms of building something specifically for physicians. Yeah. Um, So do, you know, at what point, so I'm guessing on the physician, did you, did you have a, a a pricing model or business model that, that charged the physicians or the physician, physicians just set up a profile and everything that, that was free, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So there the was physician, no like the physicians. Yeah, there was the no product. SaaS model. 
Got it. Correct. Yeah. So we we set it up honestly in a very similar way to Upwork, where there was no like subscription for the physician to be on the platform. The only way that we made money off of the physician was the take rate. So now I'm trying to remember, I think it was 20% of the first thousand dollars they make with a client. And then it dropped down to 10% after that. So for us, it ended up being around like a 14% take rate, depending on like the size of the project. So similar to like yeah, Upwork, Airbnb, all of those different types of things uh, in terms of just marketplace dynamics. Um, and then that changed a little bit like after the acquisition, but we can talk more about that later. Um, so yeah, physicians didn't pay anything to get on the platform. And if there's nothing on there for them, it's like you just either stay on there and we would email people, we would segment people out and be like, okay, there's a medical oncology job. Let's only send it to the medical oncologists. So we don't spam people too much because uh, physicians don't like that either. Right, 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 right. And, you know, so I'm looking at the at the site. So Flip, you know, and we'll get into that in a second, because FlipMD was essentially acquired by uh, GoodRx. Um, but, you know, it looks like about 22 percent of the physicians on the site are are internal medicine. After that, it's family medicine, after that emergency medicine, um, you know, and it seems like it's it's very much primary care focus, which which I I mean, no offense to my primary care crowd, but like, you know, they're not making the kind of money that like a spine surgeon is making or cardiac surgeon. So like, you know, I can, I can see why they, they'd be attracted to say like, Hey, like, let me, let me pick up some extra money and stuff. What were the kind of projects that they are being engaged on? And like, what was, um, so you guys took 20% of the first thousand dollars. And then after that, it dropped down to 10%. So like your average project, what, what was the payout and what, what were they usually doing roughly like just in general? Yeah, so looking at that list that you're looking at on the website, that's probably a pretty old list, um, but it's probably approximately correct in terms of the percentages of people. So it follows pretty accurately just like the overall number of U.S. physicians in terms of like their specialty breakdown. So it's pretty similar to the rest of the country. Um, in terms of like what projects were coming on the platform, extremely variable. So it depends. Like we had a lot of projects for specialty, like subspecialists a lot. So... You know, we had a vascular surgery project that needed a single vascular surgeon to go and do a carotid endoterectomy on a model with this company, Resuture, um, who is still in existence, still doing some cool stuff because they had basically like a new, completely new vascular model that they were bringing out to med students and to residents and fellows. And they wanted a board certified vascular surgeon to go and do an actual carotid endoterectomy from start to finish. Um, and that one had to be in person. That was like one of the only ones we had to have in person. So we needed to find somebody, a vascular surgeon in like the Phoenix, Arizona area. And so we contacted literally everybody we could on LinkedIn. I thought we brought in like 20 vascular surgeons within the area to apply to it. And one of them ended up taking it. And it was cool because like, you know, three weeks later, I saw on LinkedIn the video of the actual procedure going on. I was like, that's really cool. Like that's actually something we help facilitate. Um, some of the other projects were like, uh, we need help with like blog articles. So there was a urology startup that wanted basically anybody, anybody that's a physician to go and do articles for them. Um, either write them completely or just like confirm that everything's medically accurate. Um, we had a bunch of like market research and marketing companies that wanted to talk to specific physicians for different accounts that they had with different companies. Like, um, I think we had one that was working with Johnson and Johnson, one that was working with Stryker, um, and basically they just needed a bunch of physicians to talk to and they could have gone. So I guess the competitors that you think about for something like this are like the GLGs of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a very different model compared to a GLG. It's a lot cheaper to use the platform than go in with them. Um, what are the other ones? We had a GI device that was basically a new type of colonoscopy um, actual hardware. And so that one, they wanted to talk to, I think it was like 20 gastroenterologists and 10 colorectal surgeons all split out in terms of like, you know, one to three years out of fellowship, four to seven years out of fellowship, 10 or more years out of fellowship. So it was different segments that we had to fill, um, which means, again, you're looking for very specific people. Um, and so that one was another nice project for us. And so the projects, though, ranged anywhere from like a couple thousand dollars all the way up to probably 65 or $70,000 overall. Um, Cause some of them also were like staged. So you'd be like one zoom call to introduce the product. The second one to actually get hands-on experience with it. Cause they would actually send you the product. Again, this was middle of COVID third, you know, you're going to review it fourth. You're going to like finally tell us what we should change with the product. So 
all of the projects were so different, um, but they probably averaged out to 10 to 15,000 a project or something like that. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, when, when you were, when you were doing this, so you got your initial traction at what point did you say, okay, we need to raise money, you know, and like what, what was that inflection point? And then how did you decide the amount you're going to raise? Yeah, it was when the platform started slowing down um, in terms of like the actual technology. So there's too many physicians on the platform where to the point like even loading the jobs was taking a few seconds and we're like, okay, something something needs to change. Like this platform's not going to continue to scale. And I remember we brought in one of our advisors that's uh, very technical and he was like, you're going to want to actually switch this platform, completely do a, a rebuild of it so that you can focus on scaling it. And so that was probably like nine months in, probably the May of 2021 is my guess. So we launched in June of 2020. So and you're, yeah, at this time, you're, you're still like part time on, 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 on FlipMD. Right? I was always part time. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and, and personally, so here, here's, you know, if I, have, I can make a comment about something, I think that too many people, whether it's becoming an entrepreneur or, or doing anything, they try and look at the main template of how to do it, which is fine. And they think that that's the only way to do it. Like when it comes to starting company, people think, okay, I got to quit my job. I got to do this. I got to suffer all these things. And I think that's just, it's not true. You know, probably the most famous part-time gig, I think of all time, if you find a better part-time gig than this, you got to let me know was uh, many people know. Uh, and this is a very famous one is like, so Gary Vaynerchuk, who's, you know, well-known entrepreneur, and everything. Passed on this investment, not once, but I think twice or three times, mainly because he's like, I didn't take them seriously because they were always doing it part time. What was that company? Mailship? Uber. No, Uber. Oh, oh yeah. interesting. Yeah, okay. the guys who ran Uber, like Travis Kalanick, uh, that's, is that his name? Travis Kalanick? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, it was a part time thing for them. It was like a side hustle. And I that's did not why, know that. Yeah, so at the very beginning. And so, like, the famous story was like, I think when they were raising a, series a or b uh vaynerchuk passed on a on writing them like a twenty thousand dollar check and that twenty thousand dollar check would have been like something like two hundred million dollars if he had actually done it you know and so my point i guess my it's point nice is return that, yeah i guess my point is that i think a lot of physicians um get intimidated by the idea of like doing anything different and and thinking that like i think because we're training against you know i didn't become a physician but i went through medical school so this whole focus is like, okay, if you do this, you have to put like a lot of energy, a lot of focus and effort and everything. And I think a lot of times it's like, you know, it doesn't need to be one or the other, right? But let me, and let me ask you this. I think one of the things that you probably did well was realizing that you didn't know what you didn't know and then looked, at, looked for help to fill those gaps and voids. So like one was like, you were lucky enough that you're married to somebody who's got good business sense, but like how else, how did you figure out those, those gap, those knowledge gaps that you had and then what prompted you to say, okay, I need to go talk to this person or that person? Yeah, it was honestly not talking to anybody. It was mostly just like educating myself. So mm. you know, every morning when I would go on the bus, I would listen to podcasts that were focused on startups and or the podcast just like that you listen to. immerse yourself. Uh, so this week in startups, uh, uh -huh. Masters of Scale with Reed Hoffman. Oh, that's um, a good one. All yeah. In was just coming out. Uh, I love All In. Um, what were some of the other ones? Uh, 20 Minute VC with Harry Stebbins. Uh, those were the primary ones. Then also some Audible books, um, Venture Deals by Brad Feld, which is oh, that's a great good one. one if you, it's a really if you good know one, nothing yeah. about, yeah, if you know nothing about startup financing, that's a great one. Um, so those are the, honestly, those are like the best friends in my ear, no matter what, when I was either riding the bus to the hospital in the morning or walking back at home at night or putting my daughters down to sleep at night. Literally, I'm always listening to a podcast. I'm always listening to an audio book. That's how I learned everything about startups. Um, you know, I went from knowing nothing to knowing quite a bit. Isn't that amazing? I really feel that like uh, podcasting is kind of like the second, like second, second Gutenberg revolution. You know, so like Gutenberg came out with books and everything. It was like at the, at the first time in history where like mass education was available to everybody. And now with like podcasting and audiobooks, it's kind of like, had those not been available, like this would have would have never happened. But like while you're doing something, you could be learning at the same time. Like it's really wild when you think about that, you know? Yeah. I mean, we literally learned, you know, everything from like, you know, what is a safe to convertible node to pre post money valuations and like literally everything 
I think everything I learned about the startup world came from some kind of passive education where it was like me just walking, listening, learning, sharing it with my wife and be like, Hey, here's, here's what we have to do next. Um, like we started with an LLC, like uh, knowing now, like I never ever have an LLC. If you're a startup that's looking to raise capital, like it's always going to be a Delaware C corp. Like I didn't know that going in. So we had an, an LLC for like three months and we switched it over to a, a Delaware C corp. So yeah, there, it's just so much free education out there. If you can find it, and there's some great resources, no matter what you're doing, even if it's not like, you know, learning the startup world, there's always stuff to learn. Uh, well, and yeah, podcasts are great. And I, yeah, and I was going to say the other thing is, I mean, with LinkedIn, I mean, you have access to so many people. I mean, you'd be surprised. Like for me, I mean, this is like, what was it? Seven, eight years ago when I was like really bullish on, I mean, I'm still bullish on LinkedIn, but like back in 2014, I remember using, and LinkedIn really sucked back then. This is pre-Microsoft acquisition. I remember thinking, I'm like, oh my God. I was like, I, I can email Fortune 100 CEOs on here. And some of them will actually reply to me. Like there's some pretty pretty famous business people back then that I reached out to that I was like, I can't believe that, that, you know, and it's just amazing how willing people are, 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 are when it comes to helping each other. Right. So, so you're getting some traction and you decide, okay, we got to raise money. How much money did you guys end up raising? What, what were some of the things that you learned from that time of raising money and pitching? Cause it's, 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 I would say almost like a religious experience going through that process in, in a very, tough sense. Cause like it's, it raising money is rough no matter what you're doing. Yeah. So the raising capital piece is a really interesting story. So we ended up only raising, I think it was $162,000 for the overall company. That's it. Um, that's total, it. Yeah. So total, total and lifetime. Total. Man, total. I, I, I love this story even more. So <laughs> yeah, we, cause I was like, cause at cause, exit, <laughs> at exit, we owned like 97.5% Man. of the company. I got to I got to just stop and clap for that. I love that. Because anytime like I hear somebody like, "Okay, we raise money." I'm like, "Oh, man, let's hear it." Cuz like the moment you raise money, it's like, "Okay, oh, we can raise like it's a five or 10 company. million." Yeah, it's like, "Okay, yeah, exactly." It's like, "Hey, let's raise a bunch of money." I'm like, "Guys, could everybody just calm down." I'm like, "Do you need that money?" Even me, yeah. even me, like when I was a, you know, prepubescent like <laughs> like marketer, I did a little Kickstarter project. And like my founder at the time, who was a lot more experienced in business, we had like a little fashion company. He even told me, he's like, hey, Omar, he's like, we need, you know, to make this project real and everything, we technically need like $10,000. We're going to aim for that and no more. And I'm like, why not, we, why not raise more? He's like, because we don't need to. And I think there's, there's a lot of discipline when it comes to raising money because like, you know, you're giving stuff away. <laughs> So okay, so t t tell me, tell me, tell me about that. So you're going in front of a, a yeah. VC, like let's let's start with the pitch deck. We pitched, yeah. yeah. So we pitched, we pitched a lot of people. Um, so yeah, our, our decks, we we probably started building decks once we hit probably like that that point we talked about earlier, where it's like okay, 500 physicians or whatever. We're like okay, now we're gonna have to go out and really we raised the capital to rebuild the platform because technically we did not own a hundred percent of the platform because of the agency we went with. They had, you know, bits and pieces of the platform that were not like um, personalized to us that they owned. And I was like, that's never going to work if we ever want to get acquired. So we ended up uh, raising the capital to really just rebuild the entire platform from the ground up. And we found a dev shop that was based in the Ukraine. So we knew kind of what approximately we would need to actually do that. I think it was like a hundred K that they ultimately said would be the price to rebuild it. And so we're like, okay, let's go out and raise. And honestly, we were thinking more like, okay, let's re raise a real seed round. So like a mm -hmm. $1 million seed round and ended up pitching like literally a lot of like the top VCs in the Bay area, some top VCs on the East coast um, and ended up not really getting much traction. We ended up getting, I think two or three term sheets from East coast VCs mm -hmm. and all of them had just crappy terms in them. Um, so like Keep, warrants yeah, defi to define the crappy yeah. terms. Let's, let's really unpack yeah. that now. So, um, a lot of them were like, Hey, we're not going to let you raise the valuation that you raised on with your safes. And again, this is at like the height of the market. Right. And I was like, well, I'm not really going to go lower than what our safes were. And I think our safes were at a five and a $6 million valuation from our angel investors that we raised capital from. And I was like, I'm not going to go below any of those safes. So it has to be at least a $6 million valuation. And given how much traction we had, it was not unreasonable to say a $6 million valuation is fine, especially at the height of the market. Um, so we ended up getting one term sheet from a local VC in like the Philly, New York area. 
And they basically were looking to put in potentially 1.2 million, I think it was. They wanted to initially put in a $600,000 tranche um, with a warrant for 36 months to then put in an additional 600K in at the same valuation as they got in basically right now. And I was basically like, yeah, I don't think so. Um, like, we're not going to take your warrant. Like, if you guys still want to put 600K in, that's fine. But we're not going to allow you to just like put another 600K in three years when, you know, who knows what the actual valuation would be at that point. Um, and so that was probably the closest one that we ended up taking. There was another one from like a um, more like an angel group that was looking to put in, I think it was like a 500K check, but they lowered the valuation, I think, to like 4 million. I was like, no, we're not going to do that either. Um, and this was all in May and June of 2021. And so it was literally like right before the new academic year started in radiology. Mm. And I was like, if we raise anywhere near a million, I will actually take a year off from medicine to run this full time. And so that mm -hmm. was really like the time crunch for me was I need to know before kind of the middle of June so I can let my program director know that, hey, I'm going to go and take this opportunity <laughs> to did they know focus that, on the startup. Did they know that you had a startup? My program director knew. My program director knew. Most other people did not. Know, and so he knew. And I think yeah. that's what, personally, I think I recommend that because like, well, so like if you're, if you're in full time practice, who cares? But like, if you're a resident, like program director, good. Don't let other people know there's a temptation to talk about it, but let's just face it. I don't know why, but like medicine, aside from being really hierarchical, people love to talk smack. They love to hate on each other. And so I think that was actually pretty smart of you not to, you know, mention this to other people. And it was always my goal, honestly, for no, like nobody to actually know that I was doing that, um, doing the startup stuff, just because like if people knew that I was doing something else, they would see my clinical performance go down. And I was like, I just want to make sure that in the reading room, in the IR suite, like I'm still focused on medicine completely when I'm at work. And like, yeah, I was working on the startup on the side, you know, during lunch conferences and stuff like that. But nobody ever knew that I was doing anything else because my clinical work never like actually went down in terms of quality. Nice. I never heard of anything, which was good. Um, and so, yeah, I, I needed to know basically like, hey, if you guys are in, great, I'm going to potentially take off the year, which means Lauren and I would go full time on this and give it 100% of our focus. And, um, and this was again, like May, June 2021. And ended up passing on both of those term sheets because of the terms, because of the valuation. And it was, a, it was honestly the best move we ever made because we would have given away, you know, a third of the company, 25% of the company, whatever it is. And then literally like three months later, the acquisition stuff started happening. So, and that was really the, the height of the market. So had we taken that capital, it would have been a completely different exit. Like those investors would have done great. Um, you know, four months later, they get this nice exit. I mean, they would have had to, you know, pay short-term capital gains taxes on it because it was such a short window of them actually holding equity. Um, but yeah, it was it was a good thing that we ended up passing. Um, and so I think that's the lesson is like, if you're not 100% comfortable with the people that you're going to potentially take money from, you should probably rethink whether or not you're actually going to accept those term sheets. And 100%, I'm glad we didn't take either of those term sheets. They weren't value-add investors. Um, honestly, they were just kind of like, stingy East Coast investors that you typically think of. They're not Bay Area investors that like understand, um, you know, if you actually want to win a deal, you're going to have to likely side with the founder. Maybe not in this market anymore, but back then it was. And so, yeah, passed on both of those deals and acquisition stuff started in September of 2021. Um, so, yeah. That's that's amazing. So so your your main lesson from the time that you pitched and raised, which is this uh, more of a heuristic and I like it, which is if you don't feel 100% comfortable with the people you're about to take money from, like you should probably reconsider. For sure. I mean, it's especially like, let's say you do have a very successful company that goes on to scale and raise a series A, series B, series C, and you ultimately want to IPO. Like that's a 10 year window where you have to deal with those investors. You have every, to every quarter. <laughs> actually like them. Yeah, like you're going to have board meetings at that point, which means those lead investors are going to have board seats and maybe you have a couple independent board members. But like you need to for sure know this is the right person to have on your cap table before you actually accept that money. Um, which is again, why I think like building relationships with VCs and starting to understand how they think and how they work with portfolio companies is super, super important. Um, especially if it's again, an idea that's going to take 10 years to, to come to fruition. Like luckily for us, it was, you know, 18 months from start to acquisition. Um, definitely not like a 
Uber or DoorDash or any of these companies that take, you know, 10 plus years to actually see an IPO event. Right, 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 right. So once you, once you got the money in at, uh, while you're raising, did you have anybody, doesn't sound like you had any full-time employees. You were just using contractors and everything, correct? Yeah. So we had the engineering team. Um, we switched over from that like auction group to the Ukrainian developers who were a hundred times better. And by the way, than, for, than for, the some, group. for some reason, I don't know why this is like I, if somebody asked me five, 10 years ago, which country I, Ukraine wouldn't be in the top 10 for me, but for some reason, there's a lot of really great development companies and developers out of Ukraine. I have no idea why. But you know, just just for yeah, those I'll who plug are, them here, it's yeah. uh, it's Fulcrum, uh, based out of Ukraine. They were amazing. They, I mean, took all of our ideas, all of our features. They very professional, very focused, very like detail oriented. Um, so it was fantastic working with them. And um, even like during the acquisition stuff, like their uh, CEO had to come on to a call to talk with the CTO and the technology people on the other side to be like, here's what we built. Here's why we built it this way to really get through that hurdle of like the technical piece. Wow, that's um, amazing. And that was the one I was always worried about too, because it's like, that's not on Lord or I like we can't really help with that. It's like they're going to be the ones that have to answer the questions about what stack did they use and stuff like that which is all over my head. Um, so great group to work with. Um, so yeah, that was really the only contractors we ever really had. And then it was just Lauren and I um, working part-time. And Lauren was also working part-time too. So she was raising our daughter. She was pregnant with our second daughter and literally was answering emails like in the hospital for like customer stuff. And the new website launched, I think, either the day before she gave birth or the day after. So the new website, wow. new platform, it, literally launched like right when she was born is she a physician as well no okay no. but still that's that's unbelievable i mean the fact that like she's taking care of your kid you know i'm i'm a father now and like so my wife is taking care of our you know our one kid right now it's it's a lot of work and so like to be doing that and then so essentially in between nap times like running the company that's that's amazing it's a hell of a wife um there was a great video of uh, a time lapse of my wife taking a video of her working on her computer while our daughter is just jumping on the couch watching toy story 2 and it's like that was what we had to deal with it was like you know you 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 think this is an opportunity so you put your head down and you do the work and you're like it's probably going to be worth it in the end maybe hopefully it's worth it in the end um and so yeah she sacrificed a lot to continue building the company through pregnancy through having covid during pregnancy through delivery like i mean she put in a lot of fucking work that's Excuse that's me. a lot of work that's okay <laughs> that's okay you know every now and i i tell people like just Talk however you want. <laughs> um, no, but um, no, it's and it, it goes to say that like um, and, you know I've uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs who say this that like one of the most important decisions you'll ever make in your life as an entrepreneur is like the spouse you pick. It's so and it's so true. I mean, for me, like like just like my entrepreneurial uh, uh, story is just like you know I was not burnt out. I was more fed up with working for other people. Like I worked for some great people, great CEOs, but I got to a point where I was just like, I'm just, I can't get excited anymore. And when I talked to my wife about it, she was four months pregnant. We, you know, I have stock with a lot of different companies and startups, but I didn't have any exits. I wasn't sitting on like, you know, filming, you know, I wasn't sitting on, on exit money yet. And, and she's like, you should start a company. Yeah. I, I always told you, you should do it. Just do it. Like, we'll be fine. And she like pushed me hard, you know? And so now like, and again, like, we're first time parents now. We have a we have a one year old. Anything that's related to business in the company, I do not have. I do not. I never feel guilty about telling her I got to go out of town or that I got to do this or that. Granted, I work from home, so like I see my kid more in one day than like most people do in a week. But my point yeah. is that like my wife is not jealous of the stuff that I do. Uh, she doesn't give me a hard time about it. Like none of those things. It's I think it's just so important, you know. Yeah, it's 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 probably the most important thing, I think, no matter what. And honestly, now, like, she's, I mean, she has her own plans and, you know, they all involve, involve startups and building companies and helping other people build companies. It's like, it's an addicting thing. And it's it really, really is, hard man. when you go from, like, a startup founder or entrepreneur to, like, ever having to think about, do I want to work for somebody else? Oh, it's my like, God, you can't. It's very hard. I don't think so. It's like, you know... 
it's the entrepreneurial bug. That's like one. The other one is a startup one, startup bug, which is like once you once you experience it, like either you're all about or not. Like being in startups, just okay, just working in startup environment is really hard. Like I tell people, actually, um, in his episode just released, Daniel Hawkins, who founded uh, Shockwave Medical, that's public now. It's like I don't know, five six billion dollar company founded Avail uh, and then founded some other companies. He he has this one one thing which is like um oh damn it now now I can't remember what that what that uh heuristic was. He always asked people. It was like something about like like how how much do you worry, right? Because like you you can't like you almost have to like this is my thing. You have to be comfortable going to bed knowing that there's fires. Right? Like you have you just have like, there's just always going to be fires. Yeah, man. Yeah. Like look, like like I can talk about it now because I just like erased it, but like for a solid, uh, I don't know how many months I was carrying about fifty, sixty thousand dollars in credit card debt. You know, just starting my company. Been there, just, yeah, <laughs> just between, just between, and I know, and you know what? Like, I'm just gonna call it out. Like, some of the solopreneurs and be like, "Oh, bro, like, why are you spending?" It's like, look, I'm building something very different from you, man. Like, I'm not, you know, like I don't have a newsletter that I'm trying to just like monetize. I'm doing some other stuff, but anyways, like, yeah, like. I had to look at that and just be like, it's just numbers on a, on a phone, whatever I'm going to bed, you know, like, and, and it took time for me to like be comfortable because there's, there's a part of you on subconsciously that's just like, this is not normal. You should be freaking out. Yeah. It's like, you just have to be comfortable going to bed with fires. We had so many moments like that where it's like you go to the grocery store, you're like, I have no idea if I'm going to be able to pay for groceries right now. Like, I have no idea how much room I have on my credit card. I didn't get paid yet from the hospital because that's yeah, all yeah. going to a mortgage and kids going to school and stuff like that. It's like it was very much for us, uh, very, very paycheck to paycheck. Until yeah, that man. Yeah. But, you know, at the end of the day, what I always remind myself, I'm like, man, I live in America. Like, what's the worst thing yep. that's going to happen, right? And the other thing for, for founders who are listening, just just remind yourself, Chase Bank ain't waking up in the morning and be like, man, so-and-so hasn't paid their credit card bill, right? It's just like, like whatever, man. And, and you know, that's, I would say, did you, did, you, did you learn about the game of money through this process? Because it's interesting once you learn, learn about financial leverage and how to think about these things. You know, I didn't learn about that stuff until after the acquisition, to be honest. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> well, it's like, honestly, my wife was much more the one that was like dealing with finances when we had no finances. And then it was like, it became an interesting thing to me after the acquisition. I was like, oh, how do you like, diversify a portfolio? And like, what do we want to do with this? Uh, so honestly, it wasn't until after. So, um, so, so let's talk about the, so you raise the money, you build out the platform, you're, you're good. And now you're like, okay, we want it. We want to exit. Right. And so, no, no. 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 Oh, okay. So yeah, let's, let's, okay. So no. you raise some money. Yeah, it's what totally different. Next? Okay, good. Yeah. So on, honestly, like the, the acquisition stuff just came up randomly. So this so, was, so we'll you're focused to, on yeah, building, you're focused on good business principles and actually building a company. Yeah. Yeah. We That's were focused great. on continuing building the platform and like expanding it and growing it. We had other products ideas that would ultimately be built um, later on. But it was like, yeah, it was very much we we're going to continue doing this. Did not ever think we would exit during residency. Like I, I was expecting if we ever did exit it for it to happen two or three years as an attending, like into my attending. And so this was, yeah, September of 2021. I was pitching a, I think it was an investing investment banking firm. And basically, it's like, hey, do you guys want to use our platform for due diligence on any healthcare related things that you're looking at? And they were like, hey, we actually know some folks, some companies that might be interested in acquiring your company. This is like 25 minutes into the meeting of a, it's like a 30 minute this typical with, meeting. With an investment bank? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they were like, because uh, they started asking weird questions like, hey, what is your revenue traction? What do your numbers look like? And all this stuff. And I was like, what are you guys getting at? And uh, then the person was like, yeah, we have two companies that might be interested in this exact product. And I was like, I mean, sure. Introduce me by email. Like, I'll always have a conversation. And so they introduced us to one company. Um, and I ended up getting on a call with their VP of Corp Dev mm. like a week or two later. Um, and quick, quick question. It was all. So S yeah. Sorry. To, and by the way, if I ask a question that you don't, you cannot answer or don't feel comfortable, just, just say that at that point, what was your, and again, I'm, I need to educate both my like physician audience and like my med tech audience, your MRR, MRR or monthly recurring revenue, like run rate at that point, if it was MMR yeah, or ARR. Yeah. So ARR then was probably, 
I'm guessing around like 400 K honestly. Can't okay. Remember. Nice. And for, uh, for those, so it wasn't like insane annual, yeah. annual recurring revenue. So that's, so it's 400 K. Okay. Perfect. Got it. Yep. So from there, we basically jumped into that call or I jumped into that call and he was like all about acquisition. He was like, yeah, I'm going to bring this to like the CEO and like, we'll see what happens. Um, we're really interested. It was like, a, it was some kind of staffing company that was not necessarily like a healthcare focused staffing company, but uh, I guess they were interested in getting more into medicine and working with mm -hmm. physicians. And so um, after that call, I was like, well, that's interesting. Um you know, maybe I should figure out what does it actually look like to sell a company? Because again, I hadn't researched any of that. Like I was still mm -hmm. very much in like, how do you build a startup? Not how do you exit a startup? So that brought me down like a gigantic rabbit hole of watching YouTube videos. And like there was a, <laughs> a, a series that uh, I think a Stanford business school put out that was all about like M&A and how do you do it? And like, I they brought together a bunch of I need to watch people. that. I know which one you're talking about. I remember seeing that. So that is that worth because I remember seeing that and I was like, I don't know, so, sometimes I'm skeptical when I see like these, uh, you know, uh, universities like Harvard or Stanford, when they put out stuff on startups. Some of it's good, some of it's just absolute garbage. So that that series was actually good, in your opinion? Yeah, because they actually had panelists that like nice. ran M and A, so like corp dev people, lawyers, and stuff like that. So <gasps> bankers. And I was like, because honestly, it's a completely different experience selling a company than it is building a company and getting venture capital money. Oh, like, totally. a completely different process. And Would so, you say yeah, it's more intense. Uh, it, honestly, it's a little bit more fun. Um, because like once you realize that, Hey, people are interested in this technology and it's like earlier than you ever anticipated it happening. It was like, it was, it was pretty exciting. It was like, and it was, it was so different than anything else. Um, and so, yeah, we literally just like learned the process as much as we could. I read a bunch of medium articles. Um, and so what I did was I was like, Hey, we're getting an acquisition interest. Let's go out. Cause we had built a list, like probably at the very beginning of the company formation of like who we could potentially exit to. So who could acquire this technology that actually might want to. So we had a list of probably like 20 different companies, both public and private that we would reach out to eventually once that day happened, it just happened a lot sooner than we thought. So I did the same thing that I did with every customer and every physician. I literally went on LinkedIn. I befriended like every person in corp dev at all these different companies. I found their email addresses. I sent emails. Um, and I was basically like, Hey, we're a small company. We're 18 months old or 16 months old, whatever it is. Here's our traction. Here's our revenue. We're in to act like we got acquisition interest literally like three weeks ago or two weeks ago, whatever it was, would you be interested in meeting? Um, and so I sent probably 15 to 20 messages to folks and ended up jumping on first calls with probably 10 of them. Mm -hmm. And then. After those initial meetings, we probably jumped on second, third, and fourth calls with about six of those 10. Um, and then November of 2021, we ended up getting two offers back to back term sheets, same day, three hours apart. Um, and I was like, oh, game's on. Okay. So we got the first one from a private company and the second one from GoodRx. So we looked at both term sheets. They were very, very different term sheets. Um, the first, the private company one was much more of like almost like a private equity acquisition model where it's like, we'll acquire 60% of the company, you will retain 40% and basically like whatever you make when you're here at this company, we will give you 40% of the earnings. I could have stayed in medicine with that one. Um, but then the GoodRx offer was much higher in terms of just like the cash and the stock deal. And it was a hundred percent. We're going to acquire all of the company. So we ended up playing them both off each other. We had two offers. So we negotiated both and ended up basically two X in the good Rx offer and like one point, actually it, probably more than two X in the other one too. Isn't that yeah, it? Yeah. I was gonna say that's so what's fascinating. And I can't, I think his name is Jonathan Taylor. There's a, there's a founder uh, I, I met, many, many years ago in Florida named Jonathan Taylor, who I think had three different exits. And I think the total amount of those exits, it's like one or two billion, give or take a billion, right? But essentially like a large amount. And he, he, he said that one of the things that differentiated him as an entrepreneur is that he spent more time thinking about the last days of, of the company than anybody else, because he, one of the uh, software companies he exited, I think when they came to the table and started negotiating was valued at like, uh, three hundred million dollars or something, and then six months later, um, they exited for like 
five hundred or six hundred million dollars. And his point was like in those six months of negotiation, he added more value to the company than the two or three years prior. And so you were saying that essentially that you exited two x um, what your valuation was, like roughly, right? And so, so, so when you so when you think about that, how long was your negotiation with GoodRx? Uh, it was pretty quick. So with those two term sheets, we went back and forth probably over like a 10 to 14 day period. And nice. it was funny because I remember we uh, emailed the private company. And we're like, we're going to go with this other offer. They had no idea who it was. Um, and I was going to say, when you played them off each other, like you let them both know, like, you know, this is what another another offer looks like, et cetera. Yeah. So we, we first went back to the private company and we're like, can you increase the offer to anywhere around what this other company is offering? They uh -huh. did. And then we went back to GoodRx and we're basically like, well, we just got this nice offer. And honestly, it's probably going to be better economics overall long term because we're going to own still a percent uh, percentage of the company. And uh, then we basically got the new offer from GoodRx, which was more than I was anticipating in terms of like the eventual outcome. It was, it was a deal killer, essentially. It, like they, was, they're yeah, just like great. There That's was no awesome. way the other company was going to match it. And so uh, what, what, we sent an email uh -huh. to the private company. We're like, hey, yeah, like in order to actually make this deal work, you would have to go up to like X millions of dollars. And they're like, can we get on a call? And so I remember walking home and I ended up talking to the person that was going to eventually acquire the platform. Um, and I was like, look, like this deal is way too good. I honestly don't think you guys can match it. And I told him the number and he's like, no, we can't match it. Good luck. <laughs> That's awesome. That's I, I just, I, that makes me so happy. That's awesome. So like, uh, what day was it? Like what, uh, this, this is like a Thursday, a Monday. You remember, do you remember what was going on that day? I don't remember what day it was. It was a weekday. It was probably late in the week, um, right before like Thanksgiving. Um, and I remember cause I came home from work and it was probably like five thirty, six o'clock. Good Rx is on the, the West Coast. And uh, we got the email after. And also, this is like after talking to our lawyers. And we're like, what number should we go back with? Um, and they gave us a number. And I was like, let's put a couple million on that and just see what happens. And that's like the number they're ultimately fine with. And I was like, holy crap. Yeah, and man. Because like, like the worst thing is going to happen. We got the term sheet. And I was like. <laughs> yeah, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're just going to say no. I, like, I, yeah. like, yeah. So that's that's. That's fantastic. Man, you and Lauren must have been like high-fiving. How did you celebrate when it was all said and done? Honestly, we didn't celebrate until the actual papers were signed and the wires were completed. Man, um, I, 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 I would do the same. I tell people, even with job, just because like 10 years ago when I started in this industry, like I remember receiving a job offer from Stryker of all, of all companies. And I was like, I was working so hard to get in this year. I finally get a job offer. The, the guy calls me, congratulates me on and everything. Like five days later, I get a voicemail saying they're they're pulling it back. And since then, I've been always. I'm like, man, I don't care what people say until I see like ink on paper and to even even further like cash in my account. I don't care. Like, doesn't it means nothing to me? Well, that's the thing <laughs> with acquisitions too. It's like a term sheet is non-binding, right? So that's until a, yeah, you that's actually thing, yeah. go through everything, and the lawyers go back and forth, and like that took. So we didn't actually close on the acquisition until mid February. So uh -huh. this is from November, middle, end of November when we got the term sheet to February. So like two months of back and forth, a lot of lawyer bills. Like <laughs> we ended up spending like over 100K just like in the final negotiations of these contracts. And there's a lot to also negotiate, right? There's like the actual acquisition stuff. There's the employee contracts. Like there's more than you anticipate in terms of like what you have to negotiate. Also like the vesting schedule for RSUs for the stock piece and the escrow amount and how long the escrow is going to last and stuff like that. So there was a fair amount to, to negotiate um, back and forth. So it ended up being a nice big bill, but we're able to cover it pretty easily. <laughs> yeah. So, not, what, what, yeah. What were, I mean, like your advice to some founders, like who are entering those kind of negotiations now, I mean, what, what, what are some things that you kind of learned from that, from that entire experience? I mean, the biggest thing is like, you need to create some sense of urgency. Um, so if you don't have it, like, if you get one offer, you need to go out and try to get a second. Um, it's going to change the deal dynamics a lot when there's somebody else bidding for the company. Um, and also like, they're never going to know who that person is. Like, don't tell them like, if like, I don't, I don't think good or X or anybody asks, ask like who the other bidder was. Um, because again, nobody's going to actually say who that is. Um, but you need to create some kind of sense of urgency and FOMO, um, and try to get at least two offers. It would have been great if we had three or four, like that would have been insane to be able to yeah. negotiate off of all those different parties. Um, and then also just like 
shoot your shot, right? Like if you're a startup founder, this might be the only exit you ever have. That's so you exactly. want to make sure that you really go after it and say, how can I create kind of generational wealth for, for my family? If that's what you're going after. Um, so if you have the ability to, yeah, negotiate, like this is the only t like deal you may ever negotiate. And like, you're also negotiating with people that negotiate these deals all the time. So you need to educate yourself and figure out what are the levers that I can pull, um, that will ultimately lead to a better deal outcome for me my co-founders and my investors. And that was ultimately like what we were thinking about is like, we had angel investors. And so we really wanted to make sure that people were getting a good return on their investment. And the interesting thing is like, all of them had safes none of those safes had converted it over into equity yet because we never had a priced equity round. And can you so define I remember, for the audience what, what a safe note is? Yeah. So a safe is a simple agreement for future equity. It's basically like you give the startup $25,000. You technically don't have equity in the company until they reach a priced, uh, a priced round, which basically means like if they go on to do a series A, a venture capital firm, you know, let's say it values it at 50 million, you got in at five. So then eventually you're actual equity would come in at that 5 million, but now it's a valued at a $50 million valuation. Uh, that's when you would actually receive shares in the company. So technically nobody had shares in our company when we sold. Um, and so our lawyers were like, well, technically you only have to give your investors the cash piece. And I was like, no, we're not going to do that. So we'll, we'll combine the cash and the stock to give them an actual like nice valuation bump because like 60% was cash, 40% was stock basically. Right. Um, so if we didn't do that, that would be a real big F you to investors, which yeah, we weren't and, gonna do. And again, like this is the thing that, uh, that people have to, to know is that like, you know, word gets around. And so like the way you treat your investors, the way you do a lot of things, like people talk, like, this is one thing I tell people about, like that I I kind of learned when I lived in Silicon Valley was that like when I was out of Silicon Valley, I got I, I dealt with all kinds of just, you know, amateur founders and everything. So I got used to like signing an NDA, you know, just to look at something. And when I moved to Silicon Valley, people were like, dude, like we don't do NDAs just to have conversations. And I'm like, well, couldn't somebody like rip these ideas? I'm like, yeah, they could. But like a lot of this is built on like reputation. And if you do that once, like people will talk, like we will, people will know. And I think that the other thing is just like, you know, the way you treat your investors, if you do the right thing, I don't know. I I'm really big on karma. And so like, if you, if you build your wealth by like screwing a lot of people over, like that'll come back to you, you know, God or the universe will, 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 will make an example of you at some point, you know? Yeah, and it's also like they took a huge gamble on us, right? Like we were part-time founders, we were married founders. Like there's a lot of potential red flags for people to not oh, totally. invest. Yeah. And so honestly, it was like we're going to reward them as much as humanly possible knowing that, you know, we only had a small amount of investment um and overall from the the, you know, cash that came through it was like well worth it to give them exactly what they deserve, um, yeah. which is a nice return on their investment. Again, like the IRR on it is insane because they most of them held it for like 13 months. So we had one person that held it for less than 12 months, which sucks because they got short term capital gains tax treatment on it. Um, but everybody else got long term and it ended up working nicely for for the folks that were in it. Um, and it was, again, a very quick exit for most people. Got it. Got it. Yeah, and the other thing I was going to say is that, again, this is just from my perspective, but I think that also the optics on who you exit to, like for you, whether you decide to go start another company or, you know, uh, you do syndicate investing or you, you decide to go on the VC route, like the fact that you can say that you exited to good RX, there's, there's optics that look better on that versus saying, let's say you exit for a little bit more money to like, I don't know, some XYZ random company, you know? Yeah, I think it's helpful to have like the the public exiting to a public company, I think is a little bit helpful with like future endeavors that we ultimately want to do. Um, and, and also, I guess, like exiting that quickly too. And again, it was at the height of the market. I guess that's the other piece. Like had the acquisition happened a month later, two months later, I have no idea how to, if it actually would go through. Because literally the economy just tanked that was right after. <laughs> That was like mid 2021. It was uh, so February 2022 is when we signed everything. Everything went. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, literally two weeks later, I was putting my daughter back to bed when she woke up at like midnight. I look on my phone and Russia had just invaded Ukraine. I was like, holy crap! And then literally the market just went yeah absolutely insane tailspin it, and yeah yeah the boom years of SaaS were because uh, I knew. Founders who built companies during those times, it was, it was like 
early mid 2021 to maybe like mid 2022, something like that. And I remember like, I mean, at least in the SaaS side, like, a, and I'm not exaggerating. These are does not, these aren't my words, but like SaaS companies who would raise, let's say, I don't know, 25, $30 million. And then marketing has like a 15 or $20 million budget. So just like, and they raised at a hundred to 200 yeah, X revenue. Just, and, it's insane. Yeah. And I remember, I'm, you know, I'm part of a syndicate. And so I saw some of these deals coming through. I'm like, that makes what? no sense. That makes no <laughs> sense. I'm like, wait, how much money? Like for me, I'm, I'm a simple guy from Texas. So like, I look at these things, I'm like, wait, how much money are they making? You know? Cause like, I'm sorry, like not everybody's Amazon, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. you know, not, a, you know, and so some of these things like the, the dirty secret, huh? so many companies are hurting right now too. Cause they have oh. to grow into those valuations. Like, oh if yeah, they do down rounds. They're screwed. A exactly. Here, here's the dirty se secret about SaaS. I just learned this recently. I'm like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So you have these SaaS companies who come up with like, you know, sales software, marketing software, biz software, whatever it is, right? They all compete against each other. At the same time, they all just sell to each other, right? So like, you know, this company competes with this company, but they, they use each other's stuff. To actually grow, right? And to raise more money or IPO, investors are like, hey, you can't just sell to other tech companies. You got to sell to like another industry. So it's like construction, healthcare, whatever. That's why all these SaaS companies are going to healthcare is because they're like, okay, like that's a legit, you know, industry to go into, right? Because, you know, it's a big market. It's a big it's market. Gigantic. It's a big market. But then also like, you know, if you sell to forget about like, I don't know, the Pfizer's and Alicans of the world, J and J, like if you sell to any med tech company, it, they're not going to just drop your, your SaaS platform, like within a quarter, right? Because it's just, those industries just don't operate that way. You know, it takes a long time to get into them and sell to it. But once you're in, like you're, you're solid SaaS companies, like, some you know somebody has like a bad quarter it's like we're, we're 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 just you know getting rid of all you know all these tools and so that's why like right now it's just really rough for SaaS. and and you'll see that a lot of these SaaS companies have hired like a vp of industry right and so that you know and so like you'll have somebody who's like focused on like med tech lead you know accounting i don't know what because they're like we I gotta mean, go salesforce has a chief medical officer now yeah like, uh, yeah yeah people are I, uh focused on how do you get into some of these other places yeah yeah it, gotta it's, expand the tam somehow that's that yeah that's exactly right and again i think it's an exciting time to be in healthcare there's part of the reason why i'm like i'm staying in healthcare is that you know if you look at amazon and google and apple like these are trillion dollar companies so like they have to take big bets they can't say like we're going to go into furniture. And so when you look around, you're like, well, what's left? It's like, hey, how about the thing that like the US spends like 20, 22% of its GDP Percent on? of the GDP. Yeah, let's exactly. Let's yeah. let's do that. You know, I mean, think about Microsoft. Like we've talked about it on, on our podcast that we have. It's like Microsoft is going, is doing some interesting stuff, right? They've partnered with, uh, you know, Epic. They have Nuance now that has the dragon and it, it's all of these tech companies are doing something to get into healthcare. And it's going to be really interesting to look at over the next, you know, 10 or 15 years to see if any of them stay in healthcare because healthcare is a difficult industry to be in. Um, so we'll see. But yeah, I mean, you have to do something if you have, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of revenue per quarter. You need something to move the needle to keep your shareholders happy and, and growing. So yeah, got to do it, something. It, it, if I had to place a bet on who's going to be the most successful, I think it's going to be Amazon. And the reason why is that all these companies, including Amazon, just fell flat on their face because they came into healthcare with a tech business model. Amazon has a history, and this is like credit to Jeff Bezos, is that, and I, by the way, I don't know if it's ever, is it Bezos or Bezos? I think it's Bezos, right? I say Bezos. Yeah, yeah, Bezos. That they have like huge dumpster, dumpster fire failures and then turn that into gold. Like, Amazon Fire Phone, dumpster fire failure, that became the Kindle. Um, people forget, but they bought like pets.com and then like, uh, what else? Or something else, just terrible failures. And so with Amazon, they had Amazon Care or something that failed, but then Amazon went and acquired one medical, right? Perfect timing. And so Amazon, I think, has this approach where it's like, hey, we need to just acquire ourselves into these industries and like figure it out and then use our technology and supercharge them exactly. yeah exactly yeah Versus, especially now with like prescriptions like they're doing that five dollars a month prescription plan it's yeah like, it, exactly they have cost plus drugs and mark cuban yeah i mean it's it's becoming very interesting within did these amazon acquire industries. cost plus no 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 no, 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 no. But but, i'm just oh, saying they're just like saying general new yeah entrance yeah 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 versus like i don't know like no offense to people at google but like 
Verily's great at raising money. They raise like a billion dollars, but like I don't know a single thing that they actually commercialize. It's just like really good at like like if you're an engineer, a product person, great place to where you got a lot of cool stuff to work on. If you're like a commercial person, I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Like, <laughs> yeah, I have no idea actually what they do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no clue. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no idea, no idea. So just kind of you know wrapping things up. Just if you look back at your time, like. What would you say is, was the biggest mistake that you made? If you had to go back and you'd say like, I really learned a hard lesson from this, if there was one. Yeah, I think going with the wrong initial developers, I think that really gave us like a six month kind of slowdown in terms of what we could have done um, had we gone with actually approaching like that Ukrainian development shop first. Your so thing that is was like, a pretty big mistake, but make, like, make the it's also- Make better investment ahead of time first. Is yeah, we also didn't have the capital to do it. So it was like we would have needed to raise uh, at least a small amount of money to get started with like Fulcrum versus staying with that other company. So or maybe we just should have done it a little bit earlier, maybe three months in when we realized that, hey, there is some kind of traction here. Let's double down on that versus like spending six months with that company. Because in terms of like just like the product roadmap, it would have been, you know, three months ahead of where it would have been. And maybe by acquisition, we could have added, you know, a little bit more to the acquisition, maybe, or maybe we would have raised that capital and said, we're not going to get acquired, but that would change things. So yeah, I don't know. Honestly, like we, we played it as well as I think we could have given the fact that we're first time founders and worked out uh, pretty well. <laughs> it did. Honestly, it did. And like, you know, I remember when we were going through the acquisition stuff and, you know, still working clinically and I was asking all of my attendants, I was like, what would you guys do if you had this offer on the table? Literally 100% of them were like, I would leave medicine and spend more time with my family. I was like, okay, that helps. I mean, that's that's super helpful to get that attending perspective of people that have been doing clinical work for, you know, some of them 30, 40 years and some of them short as like five to 10. Um, and they're like, yeah, I, I would do the same thing. It's like, all right. So I feel like we made the right decisions. Um, and also like, it was also just lucky too. Like there was a lot of luck involved in terms of like, how we exited, when we exited, um, you know, had we not gotten that or had I not taken that meeting and just said, oh, I can't, I, I don't have time for that. None of this would have happened. Like I wouldn't have gone down the rabbit hole of talking to a bunch of corp dev people. And yeah, it was honestly just like one of those lucky things that you kind of need, you know, those bounces, right? You need the ball to bounce in your favor every once in a while. And we got a lot of those throughout the company formation and, and scaling of it. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because like, I mean, look, I think like anybody would agree that like the Beatles were probably one of the greatest bands of all time. But even the Beatles, in terms of like their band members, the timing, um, you know, just a lot, you know, a lot of luck is involved. Like, I think there was this period where like the Beatles almost like disbanded. And and there is, I don't know, I I might be messing up the story. There's a guy who recorded their album who's like really believing him. who's like pushing. He's like, no, why don't you guys just like do one more? I'll, I'll fund it or whatever. And they were like, no, I don't know. And they, they did it. Right. And I think the reason why I mentioned this is that like, I think a lot of like entrepreneurship has to do with the discipline of time, of like time and patience. And I think like, as you, you know, if you're, if you're really patient about doing something very specific over a long period of time, you not only outlast people, but like you give yourself like more at bats and the chance and you raise the chances of like that luck swinging into your favor, you know? Yeah. And I think honestly, a lot of, a lot of startups, you know, need that luck. Like one of my good buddies, um, I won't say his name, but he built a company, um, COVID hip happened and they had built a sporting, basically like a sports gaming company, all sports stopped. So they had no more games to play. And, uh, I mean, they basically like didn't shut it down, but there was nothing to do on the platform. And, uh, the guy went golfing with, uh, some folks and got paired with this guy that happened to know somebody at a public company that was looking specifically for a gaming company. And lo and behold, like six weeks later, they got an acquisition offer and ultimately sold the company versus like having to just shut it down. So <laughs> there are those just like rare things that just happen for whatever reason and end up being, you know, some of the best things that will ever happen to you. But again, it's all just sometimes happenstance. Like he would have yeah. never reached out to this particular company. Like they had, he would have never known that they were looking to get into sporting. Like it was a public company that you just would never be like, Oh yeah, that, they're looking for a gaming company. It's like, no, but one guy knew that and made it work. So well, if that's a sign that, that I should pick up golf, uh, I don't know what else is. Cause like recently my dad's been like, like, Oh, you should get into golf. It's really good to do business. I'm like, I don't know. There's like a big time commitment. And then this past weekend, 
uh, my buddies went to Scottsdale and they're like, we're going to go golfing. So I went, I actually had a good time. And I was like, yeah, maybe I should pick this up. Now here you are telling me to start. I'm like, all right, that's a sign. All right, I'll pick up golf. <laughs> I, gotta say, I love golf. I, I started playing it last summer, like pretty frequently. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. You meet some random people out there too. It is yeah. fun. Like, you know, the part that I like is like, it's, it's actually really good for you to be like outdoors, getting some sunlight and everything. Plus like, on a rare occasion, like I do like to have a cigar. It's like the I can't be smoking a cigar while I'm like doing jujitsu or something. I mean, maybe I could. Probably not a good <laughs> idea though. Uh, <laughs> you know, I remember I remember when I was in Austin, I saw this jogger smoking a cigar while jogging. I was like, this is very Texas. That's baller. That's baller. <laughs> I should I, that that I hate I hate jogging. I but, did like a triple take. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, I'm tur I'm Turkish, and so like uh, back in Turkey, like like so many people smoke and i'll never forget like when i was a kid like we were going to a a soccer game and just like as turkish of a looking guy as you'll think like you know he's he was like he had a big mustache you know, had a little bit of a beer belly and he you know like collared shirt like like a polo and he was running up a hill to go to the game and he was running and smoking at the same time and kind of like the smoking was like kind of like giving him a power up or something it was amazing you know <laughs> need a little boost to get up there oh totally so very kind of like uh, just wrapping up before we let you go. Um, so now that you've exited everything, like what are you up to now? Like, are you practicing? Are you investing? I know you have a great podcast you just launched, uh, the uh, the Physician Syndicate, correct? Yeah, yeah. So we're doing that. Um, we're also starting a, a newsletter, um, which you can find if you go to physicians.vc. There's a newsletter tab, which is basically all about you know, helping physicians find a bunch of these non-clinical jobs that are full-time, not just side gigs. Um, so we put out like a bi-monthly newsletter that's grown pretty nicely. And then in terms of like what I'm up to, yeah, angel investing. I think between my wife and I, we've done 12 or 13 angel investments. Um, so invest in anything digital health. She does a lot of maternal health. Um, I'll do med device. I'll do pharma. Um, and then outside of that, you know, just kind of thinking through additional startup ideas, to be honest, like uh, just had a meeting yesterday with uh, somebody that I would need to, I would need to get help from um, to do a startup idea that, that my partner Ronak and I have. Um, won't mention what that is yet, but um, we'll see where that goes. And uh, honestly, once you start a company, the itch never goes away. So I'll probably continue to start companies and you know see what happens with them and go from there. But yeah, I mean, starting companies, investing in companies, doing the podcast, doing the newsletter. That's, nice. Uh, that's my life right now. And so does that mean that you've kind of like fully exited clinical practice? Or are you doing locums at all? No. So I was, I mean, I was a PGY4 resident. Um, my residency was a six-year residency. So technically I exited clinical practice. Um, probably won't go back. Um, it's honestly just kind of it's there's too much time now with my family to say, hey, I'm going to go back to full time clinical practice and work 60, 70 hours a week again. Um, I mean, right now I get to literally wake my kids up, feed them breakfast, take great? them to school, pick them up and play golf when I want to and do the other stuff when I want to do yeah. it. So it's too it's too difficult to just say, yeah, I'm going to go back and, and give my life back to medicine. Yeah, man, I can't I can't imagine what it's like. I mean, again, like, you know, I I work from home and everything and I just can't. Like when I'm away from my kid for like a couple of days, it kills me. And I'm just thinking, I'm like, man, there's people who literally have to like they leave, they leave the house and their kids are asleep and they come back home and their kids are asleep. Kids are asleep. Like that's and work it, weekends. Yep. Yeah, like, man. There were I remember times when I, I was on call for mostly surgical year where it's like I didn't see my daughter for a week at a time because I was on you know nights and then switched to weekends and it's it's a rough life. Um, but also like we need people to do it and you know all the power to every physician out there that that sticks with it it's it's a difficult <laughs> thing at times and people burn out and you know leave we, clinical practice so we should you know so i didn't go into clinical practice i dropped out of med school like right right before my um before step one, <laughs> I think if I took step one, I would have just like forced myself to go through and I would have been stuck. Um, but we should probably, we should talk and, and maybe not a conference. We should try and do some kind of like a meetup of like people who were either in medical school or clinical practice and now like are just on the startup side. It would be, it would be a lot of fun actually to get together with that group of people. We should, we should honestly, we should there's a ton. Yeah. There's a ton of physicians that are building companies and also investing like a lot of, uh, a lot of med students and stuff have gotten into yeah. venture capital and are staying in venture capital, uh, which is cool. Like we need people that understand medicine to, you know, hopefully help fund some companies that are going to change things. Yeah. And I, I'll give a shout out to, uh, 
I guess because he's been doing it, he's kind of like the pioneer for this. But Dr. Arlen Myers started this uh, group a long time ago called Soap. Yeah, Soap Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. Um, and so I really encourage, like, if you're a physician, like, that's the first thing you should join because, like, it's 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 funny. I was telling him the other day because, like, I think the membership dues are like eighty bucks a year, and I, like I joined. I told I was like. I was like, you should raise the membership rates. But like, yeah, I, if you're a physician, if you have any any interest just to get down the entrepreneurship route, like first of all, like go check out Greg's newsletter. So physicians.vc, right? Yeah, that's the website for physicians, kind of everything. Physicians, podcast, newsletter. Yeah, go check that out. Go join uh, uh, SOAP um, and just get like, I think just getting exposure to the ideas, the people, just, just getting acquainted with the language, I think is the first, first step. But Greg... I got to tell you, thank you so much for joining joining the show. I had a blast talking to you. For the clini clinicians that are listening, I just want to remind you, click the show notes below. First, check out Greg's resources. The other thing is get your AMA PRA Category 1 CME credit. Just take 15 seconds to write down what you learned. Get it for free because the state of MedTech believes in bankrolling all your CME credits. All we ask is that if you've been listening to the show, and a lot of you have been, because I see the download numbers, you have not rated the show. So give the show five stars. Write us a little review. We're the number one show in MedTech for a reason, but I'd like to keep it that way. So with that being said, I'm your host for the state of MedTech, Omar Khatib, and we'll see you all next time. Bye for now. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of the State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show, or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at Take care and we'll see you next time.